and they're afraid they're true. <laughs> We're recording. And they're afraid that they're, they're true. And so the, the exalted destiny that this world is made for you and everything in it is yours turns into, I don't belong, I'm not lovable. And so how do we fix it? The way to understand a teenager's life, and this is true for adults as well, but it's especially true for teenagers, is to understand the paradox of being a teenager. It's poetic. The biggest secret that every teenager keeps is the, is the paradox of being an, an adolescent. They want to be seen, but they're afraid of getting found out. They want to get caught, but not by the principal, not by someone who's going to punish them or judge them, which is punishing enough, but by someone who's going to love them. Who are the loving others in a teenager's lives? You. We are the loving others in a teenager's lives. You don't have to have a PhD or an MSW or a background or have written a book on parenting and not having kids myself. All you need to do is have an open heart, radical acceptance, unconditional love, and a willingness to hear what they're not saying, see what they're not showing, and love what they're not loving. Let me say that again. In order to heal anyone, but in particular a teenager, into adulthood, into wholeness, Hear what they're not saying. Read between the lines, right? See what they're not showing. And love what they don't love in themselves. Their weight, their body image issues, their self-harm, their fear that God doesn't exist or the God that they believe in is a God who smites their, uh, their anxiety, their depression, their, their, their suicidal ideation, their feeling that they're not ever going to be enough. Love that in them. Instead of trying to fix it or heal it or change it or even understand it, simply love it. And when we say to them, I love you, really include the parts that they don't love in themselves. I love you, even the parts of you that you don't love in yourself. Their secret life, their negative organizing principles. And that is what heals, heals all of us. Interrupt me if you have any questions. If not, I will continue to share. Here's an example of a teenager or a preteen in this case, who's living a paradox. They will live in code. This is given to me by a seventh grader in a synagogue in Carl Gables, Florida a few years ago. And it was handed to me. The question was, what is your secret? What are the words in your pockets? What's your biggest secret? What are the things you're afraid to post or text or uh, have anybody know about you? And this, and most kids wrote me uh, anonymously on the, on a piece of paper, and, and then I, I I read them and we talked about them anonymously, confidentially. One teenager, a seventh grader, gave me this, a code. You see on the top, it's the alphabet from left to right, and underneath it is the alphabet from right to left, right? And then there's the letter Z N R T Z B. And it took me about six minutes to figure this code out. I want you to take a moment to just figure out what Z N R T Z B stands for. And I'm doing this for a reason. The time and the tenderness, the care and the kindness that you are using right now to figure out this seventh grader's quote code, what the words are in his or her pockets is the time and tenderness and the care and the kindness that every teenager wants. We spend so much time figuring, try, try, uh, trying to tell them what to do. We don't spend enough time trying to figure them out. This moment right now is the crucible. This is it. This is what they crave. You trying to figure them out. Am I gay? The teenager wrote. I need help. I stare at the popular boys and girls with envy. I don't know why, but for some reason, the word the breaks my heart. I stare at the popular boys and girls with envy. It breaks my heart when I get to the word the. I stare at the popular as if they are, they're bigger, they're better. They exist in larger in life. So in order to understand, let me stop for a second. I just want to catch up with you and see you for a moment. I'm going to go to gallery view. It's easier for me to see who's out there. Teenagers want to be liked. You want to be liked. Teenagers want to be accepted. You want to be accepted. Teenagers want to have permission to be exactly who they are. So do we as adults. The way to help a teenager, to have a conversation, an honest one with a teenager, is to treat them the way you want to be treated, to be liked, 
to be received, to be remembered, to not be judged. But more importantly, to get a conversation going with a teenager, it's really, really important to be able to understand that you're not just speaking to a teenager, you're speaking to the brain of a teenager. So in order to get a conversation started and then continue it with a teenager, you got to know a little bit about that teenager's brain. So here we go. A teen brain versus our adult brain. Most of the activity in our brains is right here in the front, the third eye, the prefrontal cortex, the frontal lobe. That's the thinking, that's the planning, that's the reasoning. But the teenager's frontal lobe isn't fully developed until they say, every book I've read, 25 years of age. You got a 13 year old at home, you're talking to an amygdala. And the amygdala is right there in the center, right there. It's uh, in between the ears. And that's the pleasure center. That's why when, we we, when we're talking to teenagers thinking we're talking to prefrontal lobe, they're not going to respond. They're going to respond from the amygdala. So let's break this down even more. The amygdala is, is sort of like the gas pedal on the car. And the prefrontal cortex is sort of like the brakes. We as adults know when to put the brakes on. But a teenager is always pumping, pumping the gas. So the amygdala is the alarm system, the emotional center, the fight or flight. Remember that from eighth grade science? The prefrontal lobe, that's the executive functioning, the second sober thoughts, the reasoning, the planning, right? Thinking strategically. When communicating with a teenager, yours or anybody else's, the goal in communication is to lower the amygdala fight or flight reaction and engage the part that's still, still developing the prefrontal cortex. How do you do that? Tonight, I'm gonna to tell you. I was told by Mike that you want specific information on how to talk, words. I'm gonna give you words to say and words not to say, but be beginning with this question. When given the choice, when talking to your teen, ask yourself, do you wanna be right or do you wanna be effective? If you want to be right, you're not going to get through. If you want to be effective, there's a chance they'll hear you. And here's how you do it. Number one, understand that your words have impact. And even though you never meant to say something that would hurt them, please take responsibility that maybe it did. The worst thing, one of the worst things you could say to a teenager, especially yours, is I didn't mean that. That wasn't my intention. That doesn't count in a teenager's world. Because when we communicate our intention, it's our purpose. But when the way we express the words, even our body language, right, can somehow impact them differently. My dad would say something, but I'd hear it differently because of the way he said it. And I'd feel the impact differently the way, the way he meant it. Certain words and phrases will arouse the amygdala and others will engage the prefrontal cortex. We have to become aware of our blind spots. So here's the thing. When you say to your teen, did I say something to upset you? That wasn't my intention. That's very sweet. Not going to work. The teenager's going to shut down. You want to get the conversation going? Then you got to say the next sentence. And this is true for adults to talking to adults, not just the teenagers. I see that something I said or the way that I said it or how I acted when I said it, something happened that made that upset you. Clearly it wasn't my intention, but clearly it did upset you. When we take responsibility for the fact that something, the way we said it or the thing we said did get through, impacted differently, we're getting through the teenager. Please be mindful of impact. Intention is not important as long as, until we understand that the, the, the impact of those words or how they landed will change. So here are some expressions I want you to take out of your vocabulary. The amygdala arousal phrases. Just don't ever say these words ever again. It'll pass. Ignore it. You'll meet someone new. It's time to move on. This, these words shut down the conversation because they're inciting, activating the, the amygdala. These are the best years of your life. No, they're not. They're just the years. Teenagers today don't even know the expression sticks and stones. We don't even, because they know that words hurt. Everything happens for a reason. Everything works out for the best. Platitudes, don't say them to a teenager. They know you're looking for it. You don't know what to say. God only gives you what you can handle. That's what we say at a shiva house. It's the worst thing to say to someone in pain. 
because it it, it tells them that they, all of a sudden that is, is a whole third party. Now God's in on this. It's the thought that counts, not to a teenager. My great aunt Mindel, who survived Auschwitz, used to say, as long as you have your health. But really, what about the teenager in the wheelchair? What about the teenager with mental illness? They, they, they have to count too. It's such, such a small world was our expression. But today, all you have to have is a, is a naked or half naked picture of yourself and your ex-girlfriend's phone. And it's not a small world anymore. And my mom's favorite, nobody needs to know. These are words, these are expressions that shut the conversation down. You can tell us anything. There's a reason that doesn't work. And let me stop right here and tell you why. When we... As the loving other in a teenager's life say, you can tell us anything, we've just set up a situation that's destined to failure. Why? Number of reasons. You can tell us anything is now two against one. Mom and mom, dad and dad, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. It's two against one. And that's not fair to the teenager. You can tell us anything. And secondly, can they really? Can they tell you anything? There are some parents on this Zoom right now for whom a teenager can say anything. And in fairness, and I mean this with an open heart, there are parents on this call right now who don't want to hear certain things, and that's okay. That's okay. You are welcome. You are enough. To, to say to a teenager you are enough, you've got to believe that you are enough as well. Right. So if you're a parent that doesn't want to hear that your child is questioning their sexuality, questioning their, their gender, questioning their relationship with God, with your God, that's OK. But then you can't say you can tell us anything because they can't. And so just be mindful of that. Here's how I would prefer you say it. I. Because you as a pointed finger and eyes an open door, you as a pointed finger, eyes open door. I'll say it one more time. You. Any sentence beginning with the word you is a pointed finger. It's judgmental. Amygdala, I, opening arms, open-hearted, I'm available, I'm inviting you in. I would like to be the kind of dad that you can say anything to. It's the same sentence, different impact. Same intention, different impact. Get it? And so you can tell us anything, shuts things down. I would like to be the kind of parent, opens the conversation up. Continuing on this conversation, uh, this same slide, it'll never happen here. We know that it does. We need to talk. We don't need to talk. That's amygdala. I need to talk and you need to listen. I need to talk as a parent and you as my child, I need you to listen. It Gets Better was a campaign that was created in, 19, in 2014 when Tyler Clementi uh, and um, at Rutgers University jumped off the GW Bridge. You remember that, September. He was a freshman, his roommate was posting live footage of him hooking up with another man. Uh, so they created this thing called the It Gets Better campaign. Here's the reason it doesn't work. It doesn't work because a teenager doesn't know that it gets better. For Ellen DeGeneres, and other gay leaders in, uh, and gay icons and gay popular figures say it gets better on these videos. It only tells the teenager that you don't, I don't understand what it's like to be you. So even though it may get better, I'm not so sure that it does. So it, it gets better, it gets worse, it gets better and it's worse, it gets better, that's how life is, that's life. To say it gets better is to deny them their present reality. That doesn't seem so bad, stop crying, what were you thinking? All of these are words never, never to say. In particular, the word why. It's a good idea to take the word why out of your vocabulary for adults as well. Nobody wants to answer the question why. Why is a dead end sentence because conversation's over. Got to find more creative words to have a conversation other than why. Any phrase that begins with the word don't, don't feel that way, don't worry. You know, when your parents said don't worry, right? You, you, you only worried more. <laughs> don't cry. You want to cry more. Don't be a baby. Never use the word don't. And these are expressions that other teenagers have told me. Everything I do is for you. You're so ungrateful. I don't know parents that say that, but some teenagers have told me that they did. Sounds to me like you're jealous or angry. We don't want to put words in their mouths. It's their, it's their feelings. And this is the worst of all the things we could ever say to a teenager. Time heals all wounds. Simply put, it doesn't. 
Time does not heal all wounds. And we on this call who have lost our parents or loved ones, have endured a crisis, know that's true. Time does not heal all wounds. Time gives you time to make sense of the wound. Time gives you time to adapt your life around the wound. And we live with our wounds. For many of us, the next few weeks, we're going to be planning our Passover Seder, and people who we loved who taught us about Passover are not going to be there. That wound is not healed. It's just adapted. We live with the wound of not having our parents at our Seder. So those are expressions we can't say because it's only going to shut a conversation down with the best of intentions. Remember, intention versus impact. What are our expressions? What are the words that we can say? Here are some examples of those. Uh, the three, this is given to me by a bunch of teenagers on a bus a couple summers ago. The three best things you can say to your teen brought to you by a group of teens. I'm so proud of you. There it is, the word I, beginning with I, invitation. We're going to work through this together, and you did it. But let's go a little deeper. Phrases that do work, which engage the prefrontal lobe. Any phrase beginning with the word I. I is soft. I is an invitation. I is an open door. I opens hearts. I'm starting to feel that I'm not getting through. I really want to understand your perspective. Help me out. I, I can see how you would feel that way. That makes sense. That's a great one. I can see how you would feel that way. Love this one. I can do that. It's not a promise. It's not, I'm going to do that. It's, I can do that. I hear you. I believe you. These are great expressions that help you. I love this one. At the very bottom, a father said to me at one of my talks, ah, I remain teachable. Beautiful expression. More phrases that do work, that, but don't begin with the word I. Thank you for correcting me. Is a free, engages the frontal lobe. Thank you for showing me your boundaries so I know I got too close. I know it sounds weird, but the next time you knock on the door and they say, get out of my room, you might try saying, thank you for showing me your boundaries so I know I got too close. Or just the first half, the first phrase, thank you for showing me your boundaries. It's respectful. It's treating them with respect. And then all of a sudden the prefrontal lobe is engaged. Message received. It ends every fight. Message received. Prefrontal. And the final one, most important one, I'm sorry, I was wrong. So these are expressions we can actually use, but the more affirmative the question you ask, the more you're engaging the prefrontal cortex. So here's some great, great questions you can ask that considers the impact. What was it that I said that led you to believe that I don't understand. Instead of saying, I do understand, you don't understand, I do understand. Instead of fighting back, how about just saying, what was it that I said that makes you think I don't understand? I just wanna understand how it is that I, I'm not getting it. I can see that you see it like this. However, I see it differently. How did we get here? I see it this way, you see it that way. And beautiful question, what can I say right now that would make you feel better. And by the way, they're gonna say nothing. Don't say anything. I don't want you to say anything or something like that. The question is what heals. It's not the answer you're looking for. It's the opportunity to in, introject into them, to project inside of them, the knowledge that you care so deeply and you're trying to understand the impact of your words or the, of other people's words, or the world on them. What's the most loving thing I can do or say to you right now? Nothing, but the question was asked. It's so important. How are we doing, Mike? Any questions? Yeah, well, Scott, I think this is this is interesting uh, that Jonathan just wrote, which is great advice. Um, and it's hard to always be so aware, right? We're, and I can speak from this perspective as a parent, right? Like, we're juggling so much. I get home at the end of the day and I usually have nothing left, right? And so are there ways in which, you know, are there, are, is there advice you can give to us in terms of like, at the end of the day, how do we make it so that we're aware to try and use this language? What, what suggestions do you have? Okay, fair enough. Uh, start practicing right now with everybody you meet, take out the word you, start, that begins a sentence with you and be, start beginning sentences with I. Practice when you're awake and alert. But at the end of the day, 
when your defenses are down and you're exhausted, remember your child's defenses are down and they're also exhausted. So that's the very best time of the day to have a conversation. Not when you're running around the house looking for your keys to get to work or picking them up from soccer practice because they're in the car with other people with their headphones on, their earbuds on. So it's silent in the car now. It used to be music, but now it's all silent because of the earbuds. Well, you don't even drive cars. You guys are, you're in New York City. City, but yeah, we're city the, people. At the end of the day, when everybody's defenses are down, that's when you crawl into bed with them or if they don't want you in the bed, then you're on the floor with them. But there's got to be physical contact. There's got to be um, oxytocin. There's got to be head to head or hand on a shoulder. There's got to be some physical contact. One mother told me that she likes to come home at the end of the day and, 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 and lie on the floor with her child. And they look at the ceiling at the glow in the dark stars on the ceiling. And they talk about their day. That's when their defenses are down. And that's when they'll be able to be able to tell you what's going on in their lives. But if you've been practicing throughout the day, how to, uh, it, I, look, I, I wrote the book on this, so I know how to say this, but it's, I'm, I'm simply asking you to consider using more I rather than you. And so the, long, the more you practice it, the easier it gets in the evening. But if you're finding out that you're doing it again, just call yourself out on it and say, you know, I didn't mean to talk that way. And I did it again. And I'm, and I suspect that it impacts you in a certain way and I'm working on it. Just talk about it. Tell the truth about how you feel in that moment. So what can, else I ask, you got? can I ask you a question that came in prior to? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, you tried practicing using I in that moment. Uh, uh, so there's been questions about like screen time. Um, how do we resolve screen uh, addiction um, uh, along those lines? I guess, you know, to some extent around boundaries, around um, phone use. Uh, I think we've seen, you know, a lot of studies in terms of, um, what phones do to our kids. Uh, and so one of those questions came up and I wanted to throw it your way. Great, here we go. So the first thing I'm gonna say about phones, if you want, and there's a lot to say. And the first is, is this, I wanna be gentle. <laughs> if you want your child to get off the phone in front of you, get off the phone in front of them. I have a dog. I don't have any kids. I'm on the phone in front of my dog all the time and he is impatient and waiting. And I know that I would do it in front of my kids too. I say to myself, I've got to stop doing this. I, I say one more minute, one minute, one more text. If you want your child to stop using the phone so much, start noticing how much you use the phone in front of them. Now that's not true of all of us, but it's true of a lot of us. And it's true of me. We are modeling for them all the time. Everything we do we are modeling and they're copying us. So first and foremost, be mindful of your phone use in front of them. One suggestion I heard on a, one of the TED Talks that I like to watch every once in a while was when you're, when you're, before you walk in the door at the end of the day or into the room, go through your phone, go through your text, get it all out of your system, go on Instagram, do whatever you have to do on that phone and then put it away and say, okay, I'm here. I've all... I'm I'm all I'm all here. My dad used used to call my phone. Well, my dad years ago, and I'd say, "Dad, do you have a second? I have a question for you." And he would always say the same thing. He would say, "For you, I have all the time in the world." And I know that you've said that to them as well, but we don't. And I'm putting myself in this as well. We don't model that. We say, "I have all the time in the world for you," while we're texting in front of them. So the first thing is get off your phone. The second thing is, if you want them to get off your phone in front of you, say it nicer. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. say it nicer. Everybody responds to sweeter talking. So here's how I talk to teenagers when they're on their phones. I say to them, hey, could you guys look at me so I can see your beautiful faces? Please put your phone away so I can see your beautiful face, so I can see that you are enough so I can love the things in you that you haven't learned to love, so I can see what you're not showing. I wanna see you. It's a whole different game now. It's no longer a punishment to put your phone away because if we're telling the, if we're saying it to them in a way that's, that's um, punishing, pejorative, then they feel like there's something wrong with it. 
as opposed to saying, I just, I really want to see you. I want to love you. It's the thing I said to you at the beginning of this talk. At the very top of tonight's Zoom, I said, show me your faces. If you can, I know you have other things you have to do, and I appreciate that you're here. But, sh but it, when I say, show me your face, I'm saying so that I can love you more, right? My great aunt Mindel, who survived Auschwitz, used to say, listen carefully, this is really important. In Yiddish, tuchus tish, skadi, tuchus tish. Put your tush on the table. Lay your cards down. Take your words out of your pockets. Tell me your deepest secrets. And then she would say, as she'd push a plate of babka in my direction, she was a babka pusher, Aunt Mindel was. She would say, which means, so I can love you more. Show me your face so I can love you more. Tell me of your pain so I can love you more. Tell me about your day. Give me more of you to love. Mm. We can't, they're not going to do that if we make it a punishment to put their phone away. Number three, there's a rule in my best friend's house. Who's, she's got three teenagers, one in eighth grade, one in 11th grade, and now one in college. In their house at 1030, everybody puts their, except for the college kid. He was a senior in, until he was up to the, the year uh, a, a senior. They put their phones outside their bedroom doors plugged into the uh, outlet outside their door. And every night she goes and sees the phone is on the floor outside their door. They don't get to go to bed with their phone. Mm. I, I, I want the silence to resonate. That they get to go to sleep with their phone. You wake them up. Give them an old fashioned 1975 alarm clock. <laughs> but the fact that they get to keep the phone 24 hours at the age of 15, speaks to the reason they're on it so much in front of you. Boundaries, right? And then I have a, I do one-on-one -on -one counseling with, with teenagers and one of them, uh, one of the moms called me and said, he's on the phone all the time. I don't know how to get him to get off the phone. And, and she's paying me to do this. And so I, I sat him down and I said, talked to him about this and I explained to him that, um, that, it's there's a they don't understand that there's a message that they're giving to the world which we were we were taught morality the definition of how we behaved in public morality was different in the 70s than it is today 40 50 years later it's just it's just so different back then you would never sit at a table and read the paper we remember growing up with the yellow phone uh, on this, on the on the wall in the kitchen with the spiral cord that was tangled because uh, my sister would always drag it and then pull it back and it was tangled. If the phone rang, mom would always say, "Don't answer that. We're having dinner." Right? But now we're at you go to any restaurant, you can see teenagers and family members all sitting on their phones, and it's how we communicate. We're being intimate by ignoring each other. There is something actually quite sweet about that. We can be so comfortable with each other in each other's presence that we can kind of ignore each other, but be comfortable in each other's silence. Like, but, but that kind of behavior, as sweet as it might look, uh, has changed the definition of morality of what was what was a moral acceptable thing back in, it was never acceptable in the seventies and is acceptable today. And so uh, I want to get, I told this teenager, and I'm asking you to tell them as well, to, to, un, to redefine what they think of as the social construct, a social code. Let's even take the word morality out of it. The social code has changed. And it's, it's our responsibility to bring it back. It's not okay, but they don't know that. They don't know that. It's not their fault. They don't know that it's not okay to be on the phone all the time. And then we get angry with them, but we didn't teach them the social code. Mm -hmm. The social code that they're living under has been taught to them by their friends, which is to be on the phone all the time. Or if you're in a family, it's on the phone all the time. That's their social code. It's our responsibility to, to teach them what we were taught. It's mm -hmm. dinner time. We don't talk on the phone. It's rude to be looking down. They don't know that it's rude. They don't know that it's rude. And then we get angry at them and they're like, what are you, why are you so angry at me for? 
It's okay at school. It's okay at, 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 at the table for lunch. It's okay when I'm with my friends. Why is it not okay here? Because they don't know that the, the social code has changed. So, so I think that's, a, oh, sorry. Good. My, no, no, I, I um, first of all, you, what you're saying, it, uh, it totally resonates with me. Um, and I now know that I need to put my phone outside my bedroom at night. And since my wife's on this call, she can hold me accountable to it. Um, I wanted, you, you were talking about boundaries. And so um, some of us come from, uh, or some of our teenagers live in multiple homes. Um, and so one of the questions that came up um, is, how do you adjust boundaries or rules for teens when they are spending time in two different households? Um, and I know uh, different people have maybe blended families or there are raising teenagers in two different households. Maybe people have different constructs. Um, and so I wanted to raise that question up, up to you, Scott. Yeah. Uh, it's difficult raising a child in two different homes. And it's really important, obviously, that there's consistency in each home. That's not going to happen. The most important thing in that case is to be able to not put the child in the middle because one parent's parenting skills are different from yours and they're not, you're not working together, you're not in sync. So the first thing to do is to give the kid a break for not, for being in the middle. It's not their fault that there are two homes that the child is growing up in. Secondly, it's important to keep the lines of communication open with the teenager. The most important thing is for your child to know that they are unconditionally accepted and your presence is always there. And that, 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 and, and to be able to talk about this is it's when you go to dad's apartment, it may be different there, but now you're here with me and here's how we do it here. And let's talk about the cognitive, cognitive dissonance that that creates for you. Let's, let's talk this off in tish. Let's put it on the table. Let's talk about how difficult this can be and we'll try to figure it out. It's an opportunity for a conversation. It's a great opportunity to have a conversation with your child about what's really happening in their lives right now. So they can say, this is really hard for me. And you can say, I agree, it's hard for me as well. Let's see we, what we can do to figure this out. But the main thing is that you're talking about it. What else you got? Well, I want to open it up if there are anyone, anyone else that has any other questions that are on these are some of the, the questions that came in. So again, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat. Um, I think we addressed some things already. Um, phone handleage says, I think one of these questions is about um, what do we do about, um, how do we teach teenagers how to be grateful? How do we teach to teenagers about gratitude? That was a question that also came up. Right. I saw also there was the bit about them being entitled as well. Yeah. So let's go to the earlier one that I saw. How, why are teenagers so entitled? Was that one that was there? Yeah, I was trying to rephrase that in a different way. But yes, why are teenagers? what it is. So teenagers I, was trying to, I was trying to rephrase it. Yes. The question is, why, if you want the question is, why are today's teenagers so ungrateful and entitled? Yes. Right. I was trying to smooth it. Um, there's, no, there's no need to smooth it over. Okay. And it's a tough answer. Uh, and I'm preaching to the choir because you're the ones who came tonight. But uh, <laughs> we are helicoptering our kids and we are feeling for them. We are doing the feeling for them. We are so afraid. And I'm speaking in tremendously generalized terms here so that I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, especially you guys who came tonight. Generally speaking, parents of Gen Z want their kid to be happy. I just want my kid to be happy. I only want my child to be happy. But is that really gonna happen? And whose definition of happiness? Theirs, yours, Zadie's? And I'm serious about this. I have a friend whose daughter, his Jewish daughter is dating a black man. Zadie's pissed. Zadie's very disappointed. And so for the mother to want her child to be happy, she's got, whose happiness we're talking about? Grandpa's happiness who's paying for her college education because she's dating a, a non-Jewish man and a black man. So we got to stop. We've just got to stop this. I need my kid to be happy or this beautiful expression. I'm only as happy as my least happy child. This is in, uh, there's an enmeshment. It, it's sweet. It's a beautiful expression. I know I'm not a parent, so how can I say that? But there's an enmeshment there in that expression. 
and this desire for them to be happy. Happiness is a destination, is a is a journey. It's not a destination. It's a it, it's not it's it's it it comes and goes. We're happy. We're not happy. That's one thing. Secondly, there are so many parents of Gen Z kids who are because they want their kids to be happy, they're afraid for their kids to have feelings, to feel their pain. Teenagers today are growing up with so many more issues, stimuli, stimuli than we grew up with, because particularly the internet, right? And their brains are growing, are not growing any faster, but they're, but puberty is. So puberty is happening to a, when I was growing up, 14, 15, now it's 11 and 12. You know, hundred years ago, it was 14, 15. Now it's 11 and 12, right? So the body is changing faster, but the brain isn't. The brain's still not developing until it's fully developed to the 25. So they're being stimul stimulated by society, by the world, by the internet. They're exposed to things out there because you gave them a phone when they were 10 years old, when they were 11 years of age. So they were open to the stimuli of the world, but the brains can't process it. So there's a dissonance that's going on for them. And then we don't want them to feel their feelings, generally speaking. We're so afraid for a teenager to be in distress. And this is an expression that every therapist now uses. It's the therapist expression, distress intolerance. Not my expression, it's every social worker's expression. We can't have our kids being in distress. I've been teaching for 30 years. In 30 years, never has a teenager approached me and said what they've said this past year. BBYO. In 30 years, never has a teenager said, you didn't warn me that you were going to say words that would make me feel bad. You triggered me. You said cutting. You said suicidal ideation. You said eating disorder. You need to, this is a teenager who spoke to me in this way, with complete authority, you need to warn us. You need to warn us that we're going to be triggered. In 30 years, that's never happened, but it's happening now with Gen Z because parents and grandparents and teachers are so afraid that that child can't tolerate their pain. I'll give you, I'll tell you what happened in that moment. The, the teenager, the non-binary teenager said to me, when you talked about these issues, especially cutting, I had, I hyperventilated and I had a panic attack. And I, I said, no, you didn't, you just didn't. Because if you had a panic attack, I would have seen it. So tell me exactly what happened. And that they said that they kept looking at the chair in front of them saying, don't say the word again. Don't say the word again. Please don't say the word again. And I said, that's not a panic attack. That is how you survived. That's a coping mechanism. Good for you. You learned how to sit through your distress. Mm -hmm. But instead, generally speaking, parents of Gen Z today now want to get that kid out of distress. So they don't have to go to school. They don't have to learn that. And that's what's happening with this whole, that's what's happening in Florida right now. White people can't handle the distress of learning that, that white people lynched black people in 1895. So we can't talk about it because it makes white people feel bad. It's a larger example of what's happening with, generally speaking, not you, generally speaking, many parents today. So we've got kids who can't feel their feelings translate to, I'm entitled. I don't have to feel those feelings. Hmm. I have a client who's who can't feel he doesn't know how to feel talk about his feelings because his mother does all the feeling for him i know because she calls me to tell me what to tell him so she's feeling for him got it all right sonia thank you for all your beautiful nodding and it means a lot to me and what else you got there mike so there are no other questions that have come right. through the chat and uh, so we have about three minutes left um and so i guess I guess my question for you is with three minutes less left in our session, um, what's the most important takeaway you want all of us to walk away with? What you're feeling right now. I'm hoping that most of you are feeling, oh my God, I want more. I need more. There's so much more. I have 70 more slides. I cut them down from 150 slides. It's 336 pages. I'm hoping you're feeling right now, I want more because there is so much more to parenting than a 45 minute Zoom. We need to talk about sex and sexual health education and HIV and AIDS, which has not gone away. And PEP 
and prep and how to protect your child when they get to college. We need to talk to, 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 to you, to parents about consent, rape on college campuses and what happens and how to get a teenager, boy or girl, male or female, to be able to withdraw their consent after they've given it. Because a yes can be a no in a moment. That yes can turn to a no but you've already given your yes. We need to talk about ways in which to help a teenager through their suicidal, suicidal ideation, their self-harm, which by the way, are two ends of an opposite, the polar opposites. Self-harm is not a suicidal wish. Suicidal ideation is a whole different part of the spectrum than self-harm. Self-harm is a desire to feel, a need to be alive. Suicidal ideation is a whole different game. We need to be able to talk about how to sit with the teenager in their pain so, if they, if, so that they can tolerate distress. We need to learn how to tolerate their distress. Mm -hmm. So I will leave you with this final thought. What you can't fix in a lot of what's going on in a teenager's life today and their world today cannot be fixed. And it's gonna get worse for the people in Tennessee and Florida, and soon other states to follow. It's going to get really bad. What we can't fix, we can feel. If you can feel the pain they're feeling, I know it's painful. I don't even know because I'm not a parent. To feel their pain, the worst thing in the world, right? But if you can feel their pain, you'll be modeling for them how to feel their pain. Because as I said earlier, everything we do is modeled. We are modeling for them everything. So if we can feel their pain for them, with them, not for them, with them, there's a chance that they will feel, have the courage to feel their pain. And how do you do that? Literally, not figuratively. This is not a metaphor. Literally, get on the floor. Get on the ground with them, shoulders touching, and feel their, their pain, their anxiety, their depression. Don't fix it. Don't judge it. Don't try to take it away. Just feel it with them. Share it. Distribute it so it's lighter. And then get off the floor with them and then feed them some a plate of babka and say, I thank you for giving me more of you to love. Thank you for giving me more of you to love. The, the most important thing I can say to you is this. There are many reasons that we're alive and there are many ways that we can answer the, the question, what's the purpose of life? What's the reason that we're here? And you all can give a beautiful answer and you'd be right. I'm gonna give you my answer. The purpose of life, the reason we're here is to add beauty to the world. But the way we do that is by adding your beauty or helping them to add their beauty. And the way to add beauty to the world is to simply be. And if being is pain, then be in pain. And if you have permission to be in pain and to be witnessed in your pain, you've added beauty to the world. That's the goal here. How much more beauty can I add to this world where there is so much darkness and distress I can touch it with my beauty and my beauty is my authenticity. And if my pain is my authenticity, then that's what I'm going to give. Well, Scott, um, thank you so much for taking this time to be with us tonight um, and for teaching us these lessons. Um, we are very grateful. Um, I just want to uh, uh, thank you to Scott. Um, thank you to uh, Central Synagogue, CSAIR, to Park Avenue, Congregation Road of Shalom, Stephen Wise Free Synagogue, and Temple Israel of the City of New York. Um, please look, uh, check your emails. Uh, we do these about one, once a month, um, and we bring get the opportunity to bring in such amazing people like Scott Freed um, to learn with uh, to learn with you. Um, and I can see that I'm learning more, uh, and we'll try to practice. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, spending time with us to to grow. Thank you. I, my email is here, scott at scottfried.com. If you want to reach out to me, I'd love to hear from parents. This is It's on my website, scottfried.com. Thank you for coming tonight. I really appreciate your presence. I've enjoyed your company.